I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, thank you for this day, for this music, for this sanctuary, for this people, for this time, for this place. Thank you. We pray as we gather now around your word specifically at this time and in this place that you would bless us. Bless us with wisdom and inspiration through the words of my mouth and all of our hearts and prayers. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. About a thousand years before the time of Jesus, there was a famine in the land of Judah, and in particular in the town of Bethlehem. There was a famine in the land of Judah, in the town of Bethlehem. Now we might recognize that name, Bethlehem. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. We sing that every year at Christmas because that would be the town where Jesus would be born a thousand years later. But here, so many years before Jesus' birth, there was a famine in that land and in that town. And therefore, a man and his wife and their two sons left their home in Bethlehem in Judah and traveled far to the south to a distant land called Moab, M-O-A-B, Moab. Say that with me, Moab. There was food in Moab, and so they left the famine in their homeland to find food in Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. Good, rolls right off the tongue, right? Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Elimelech and Naomi and their two sons went to the land of Moab, and they put down roots there. We don't know exactly how long they stayed, but it must have been for a good bit of time because each of the two sons married a Moabite woman, settling there. But in time, Elimelech died And so did the two sons. They also died, leaving the women then widowed. At this point in the story, Naomi decides to go back home. The famine is, after all, over in Bethlehem, and she's been an expatriate the whole time in this distant land. She decides to go back to her people. Before she does, she gathers her two daughters-in-law and says to them, you stay here. Don't worry about coming with me. This is, after all, your country, your people. This is where you belong. And besides, you're still young enough to get married again, to have children of your own. Start your life over again here. One of them says, that's good advice. And she followed it. She parted from Naomi and went back to Moab. But the other one, whose name was Ruth, said no. And here's our scripture for today. The book of Ruth in the Old Testament, chapter 1, verses 15 through 21. Naomi said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Go, do what she's doing. But Ruth said, no, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I too will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. Well, when Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more to her. And the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women of Bethlehem said, Is this Naomi? But she said to them, Call me Naomi no longer. Call me Mara. 
Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? The Word of God for the people of God. Some of you may know the book of Ruth very well. It's only four chapters long. It's a good story. It's a good book. And it's easy enough to read within about a half an hour of a Sunday afternoon. So if you'd like to do that today, I encourage you to do that. We had to stop somewhere for the interest of time for our worship service today. But these verses from the book of Ruth, or some of them, are often read at weddings. Often read at weddings. Maybe you've heard them. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I will die. They're great words about commitment and togetherness. What vows, taking vows till death do us part are all about. But in reality, I would suggest today that these verses are maybe more appropriately read at a funeral. Because, you see, death provides the backdrop for this whole story. Within the first five verses of the book of Ruth, 50% of the main characters die. Three out of six. In other words, if there's no death happening, there's no story Death is the impetus for this whole story being told. As if to remind us that death is a reality for all of us. Now, we don't know how Elimelech died, and we don't know how the two sons died. We don't know how old they were. We don't know if they were sick for a long time or if they died suddenly. We don't know if it was due to an injury or an illness or an accident or anything else as those scriptures reminding us that in the end of the, at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter. In the short run, all of the particulars about a person's death do matter to us, the survivors, because it probably affects the severity and intensity of our feelings. But in another sense, in the long run, it's almost as though it doesn't really matter. What does matter is that our loved one is gone away from us as they once were, and there's nothing we can do to change that. There is, however, something we can do. We can choose how we respond. We can choose how we respond. We don't always choose. In some cases, we we may, someone may argue that we never really control the outcomes in our lives, but certainly there are many instances where we don't choose our outcomes, but we can always choose how we respond. We can always choose how we respond to the adversities that come upon us, and particularly the adversity that's created by the absence of a loved one in our lives. And when we look to Ruth and Naomi for guidance about how they responded to the adversity of death in their lives, we learn some interesting things. We learn, first of all, that Naomi was bitter. Naomi was bitter. She comes home to Bethlehem, and the town gathers around and says, Hey, isn't that Naomi? We recognize you. Aren't you the one who used to live here, but then during the famine went down to Moab? And she says, yes, it's me, but don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara, Mara. And that word Mara literally means bitter, bitter. In her grief, she has become bitter. And I have said this at the other two services. I'll say it, say it very honestly here. I don't know if I, Michael, have any influence over your lives, but if I did, I would tell you it is okay to be bitter. It is okay to feel bitter when you suffer the loss of a loved one. It's okay. You're allowed. Right? Be kind to yourself if those are your feelings. We experience bitterness because it's part of the grieving process. It's not the only part of the grieving process, but it is a part. 
and we experience it because often we, we experience death as being unfair. Unfair. In a perfect scenario, I guess, in a, in a quote-unquote perfect scenario, our each, every single one of our loved ones would live to the ripe old age of 100 and whatever, right? And they would be nimble and spry and of sound, clear mind all the way to the very end. And we would have all kinds of conversations about tying up loose ends and telling them how much we love them and apologizing for all of the past hurts we were hanging on to. And then one night they would just sail off on the arms of angels in their sleep, right? That's kind of a perfect scenario. But what happens? That's not the way we experience death. We experience it as not fair often. It's not fair that a a parent has to attend the funeral of a child or, God forbid, a grandparent of a grandchild. That's not fair, right? It's not fair that somebody dies like that. And we didn't have the chance or didn't take the opportunity to tell them all that we wanted to and tie up loose ends. It's not fair that a a young mother or a young father dies leaving young children to grow up fatherless and motherless with a whole future ahead of them. It's not fair that someone who lives a conscientiously healthy lifestyle contracts a terminal illness that we associate with people with unhealthy behavior. That's not fair. That's how death comes to us. And that's where Naomi was. She had loss after loss after loss. And she threw up her arms to heaven and said, God, what's going on? Come on, you're piling it on. How much more can I take? Right? Makes us bitter. It's okay to feel that way. But... The good news is, that's not where the story ends. Because even in her bitterness, she and Ruth found community. They found community. Their bitterness did not isolate them. They found community in each other. Ruth and her grief pledged to stand by Naomi in her grief. To, to, to put arms around each other and to put feet in front of each other as they searched for a new normal, not knowing when or how it was going to happen or what it would look like. They found support in each other at a time when they needed each other. They were community for one another. And when they came to Bethlehem, they found another community that was ready to welcome them, that came out to meet them, that was a stir and a buzz about them, that recognized Naomi, and most importantly, a community that just sat there and let her unload all of the pain and bitterness in her heart. Sometimes that's that's what's asked of us to just be there, not to fix the problem, but just to be there while the problem is just shared and laid out there. They found community at home. And in that community, they kept the faith. If we were to go on reading in the book of Ruth and turn to chapter 2 and then turn to chapter 3, we would see that Naomi, in her grief and bitterness, still followed the laws of God. She still lived her life by the word that she had learned in community as a child growing up. She still hung on to the scriptures, to the word of God. And she taught them to Ruth, who was new to the faith. Even in her grief and bitterness, she didn't give up on people, on community, and on the word of God. And because of that, some really wonderful things happened. Ruth would go on to marry again. And she would have children. She had a family. And did you know that she would become the great-grandmother of a man named David? Yeah, that David that slew Goliath and rose to be the king of Israel. And that he would be the 28th great-grandfather of a man named Joseph a carpenter from Nazareth who was betrothed to a woman named Mary who gave birth to the Savior. 
Because God brings forth life, life from adversity, from the pain and bitterness of death. So today is All Saints Day. It's a day when it's appropriate to think about this story of Ruth and Naomi. Because All Saints Day, the first Sunday in November at our church, is always a day when we are reminded of the reality of death, but also God's desire to bring forth life from that death. We all experience death. We've all lost somebody dear to us. And we all, like Ruth and Naomi, have a choice about how we will respond. If we're bitter, that's okay. But we don't want our bitterness to isolate us from community. We don't want that that to isolate us from our connections with one another. Why? Because the community can help carry us When our faith is weak, the community can put its arm around us and help us take one foot, put one foot after the other and go forward as we try to find a new normal. And did you know that things like sadness and depression grow exponentially the more we are isolated from others? You know, it works this way. I'm sad because something really hurts me and that means that I'm vulnerable and broken and weak and I And and my inclination is to withdraw from people because I I don't want them to see this brokenness. And that makes me sadder because I'm disconnected from community. And I become, and I pull away even further, and it grows and grows and compounds. That's why we want to be persistent, persistent in clinging to the word, clinging to the practices like communion and candles, cling to the practices of the community that can carry us forward when we are at our weak moments, not giving up on God because salvation really comes not in place of adversity but through it. Salvation didn't come in place of the cross but through the cross. And that's why we light candles today. Candles, each one of these candles that are already lit from our 8 o'clock service, each candle represents some loved one that somebody's carrying in their hearts who's no longer here as they once were. And in some ways that, you know, this day is, is about sadness and it's okay to acknowledge it's sad, it's a little sad. Because whenever our loved ones go, it's always too soon. I would even argue that that person in the perfect scenario that lives to the ripe old age of 100 plus when the moment of, of death comes, we're still not ready. Right? I'd argue that we never get to a point where we say, yeah, God, go ahead, we're done. Right? The heart always wants to hold on. Right? But these candles are also about a divine reality that is always true whether our bitterness blinds us from seeing it or not. And that divine reality is that there's nothing that not even death itself, as Paul says in Romans, Dan Brintlinger's favorite scripture verse, Romans 8, 38, 39, there's nothing, not even death itself, that can separate any of us from God's love in Jesus Christ or, or from our loved ones who dwell in that heavenly kingdom with him. So we are going to light candles today. In just a moment, Dick Kane is going to read the names of 11 saints of this church represented by these candles, 11 of our beloved church members who died in this last year. As he reads each name, Don will light a candle in their memory and in honor of their eternal life, and Dee will play a chime. And then after they're done with this, Dee is going to play some music because these are not the only 11 people that we carry in our hearts today. Each one of us here is probably thinking of a a grandparent or a friend or a colleague, family member that they've let go into the hands of God at some point in the past, maybe long ago, maybe recently. But after we light these 11 candles, we want to give everybody the chance to light a smaller candle for these loved ones. The balcony can stay in the bed. There's candles up there already in the balcony. Choir, you can come down here if you're motivated. You don't have to do this, but we're going to give you the space to do this if you'd like. Come forward down the the aisle here. Light a candle from from the white candle here. We recommend that you squeeze the candle and hold it to the side. Then you don't burn your fingers. It's kind of important. And then when you're done, when everybody's had a chance to do that, we will close with a prayer. 
David Bolin. Charlie Brown. Jean Friend. Joanne Gustin. Marguerite Carl. Harold King. Doris Little. Jan Patrick. Rosalie Poland. Larry Prince. Evelyn Sperry.